All right, good morning. Welcome, good to see you here this morning. It's uh, our second service, obviously, the traditional service. First service was uh, very good and uh, um, uh, very blessed to be all together. So welcome if you had a good week. I'm trying to think of what's else is new and exciting. Oh, um, first service, we did have uh, Pastor Randy Powell visit us from APCOPAD. He's one of the new leaders from APCOPAD, and he was speaking about just all that's going on uh, in the, uh, the region for uh, the American Baptist Association. So a lot of things going on. Uh, he did also mention that... Uh, in his new position, as they're going through things for APCOPAD, uh, there's, in his area alone, I think he said about 44 churches, and of those 44 churches, he said 10 of them uh, don't have pastors, cannot find pastors. We said make sure that, yeah, um, just be aware of that, you know, pray situation, but he said, you know, pastors are few and far between trying to find to fill those positions at the current moment, so we're just trying to, they're trying to figure that out, but uh, that's what he had mentioned, so that's about a, a quarter of his uh, area or region that he's in charge of that they're trying to find a place and they can't really find anyone but uh, that's the only update that he had in terms of that. Uh, what else is oh I, I guess uh, there is something kind of new and exciting you know some uh, Trina and I are expecting a new addition to the family so that is a new uh, a new thing that we're uh, excited about so she's due in June so we'll have another little one running around and it's going to be it's going to be crazy, and uh, actually we, uh, we found out here oh, a couple, couple days ago, we found out whether we're having a boy or a girl this time, and the uh, real answer is, we're having a third boy. <laughs> we're having a third boy. We thought maybe you know, we have a girl this time, but no, we're having a third boy. Um, so hey, we're still blessed, we're still thankful, we're still happy. Um, but it'll be crazy, it'll be exciting, but that's, uh, that's all there. But anyways, um, welcome, glad you're here this morning with us to join. So we're just going to jump right into the Word this morning. So uh, again, we are continuing through our books of the Bible, right? We started back in the book of Genesis all those months ago, and we're moving forward. We went through the Old Testament, and now we are in the book of Acts. And so that's what we're talking about today. And again, the purpose of this whole series is for us to take just a uh, overall view of the Bible, of, of, of Scripture, and to be able to, to really take a look and see uh, what is the meaning of these books? You know, wh wh what can we learn from these? Um, and also, too, I don't know, Leslie, if you want to, is, is, that, is that camera on for the other room? Maybe from, okay, good, I'm double check that. Uh, and so we are in the book of Acts, and that will help determine, okay, what is this book all about? Uh, because so many times we read the Bible and we're not fully understanding what we're reading. So um, today's message will be a little different. Three components. First, quick overview of the book of Acts, just give you the, the, the nuts and bolts of it. And then we'll talk about some theology points and then the practical application. So author of the book of Acts. Well, uh, the book of Acts does not specifically say who the author is, uh, but we know the same author wrote Luke and Acts, and tradition has it that it, it is um, Luke. Luke is the author of Acts. Uh, he is the companion of Paul. And so we see that date of writing, about 61 to 64 uh, AD. And the purpose of this book, why was it written? It is going to tell you the history um, of the early church. And it's also going to talk about the Holy Spirit um, and the amazing events that happened on that day at Pentecost. And we'll talk a little bit more about some of those things. Here are some of the high points in the book of Acts. We won't go through them all, but you can see chapter 1, it starts with Jesus' last appearances to his disciples. And then chapter 28 will actually end with Paul being in prison, house arrest, and he's writing, most likely writing some of the letters um, that we find in the New Testament. Um, so we see kind of some of those main points in here. Um, one of the best ways to see the importance of the book of Acts is to imagine the Bible without it. So the New Testament kind of can divide into two neat sections. So the first section would be the four, the four Gospels, right? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We already threw those. Those talk about the life and the ministry of Jesus, his death and the resurrection. And then imagine there's no book of Acts. You would go right to then Romans. So imagine you're reading all of this about Jesus, his life, his ministry, his death and resurrection. And then all of a sudden you turn, you're in the book of Romans and you have some guy named Paul writing to the Romans. And then you keep going in the book and you have him talking to different churches in Galatia and, and Ephesians and Corinthians. And you're like, wait a second, what I miss here? How, how do we get from Jesus' death and resurrection and now all of a sudden you have this guy Paul, whoever he is, and he's talking to the 
the church and the Romans. He's talking to these other churches. Where they come from? How, how where they come about? And so the book of Acts really links and makes that connection, right? You can in the book of Acts, it will tell you how that happened, how the the gospel spread, how the church began. Uh, how Paul, who persecuted Christians, hated Christians, became a Christian because he encountered the risen Jesus. Uh, it'll, it'll tell you um, so many different things, especially about the Holy Spirit as well. And so just keep this in mind as the significance of the, the book of Acts. Here's a few, uh, I guess, little sub-facts of the book of Acts. The first seven chapters shows the church in Jerusalem. The next five cover the focus on Judea and Samaria. And then after that, it's basically how the, the fall of the gospel spreads outside of Roman civilization. Um, first chapter, 12 chapters mainly focus on Peter, and the rest of Acts focuses on Paul. But again, these are just a quick overview. That way you can have a general idea of what we're talking about when we are in this book of Acts why it was written, what is the purpose, and what are some of the things that we're going to see outlined here in the book of Acts. Um, so, okay. So, we've already talked, you know, and again, as Christians, we know that every worldview, because every, everybody has a worldview about reality, every worldview has to answer those four fundamental questions, right? Origin, meaning, morality, destiny. Origin, where do I come from? Meaning, what is the purpose of life? Morality, how do I determine what is right and wrong? And destiny, what happens when a person dies? Everybody, everyone, has to have a worldview about that. Every worldview answers those fundamental questions. Obviously, Christianity, we see origin, God, the world, the universe is created by a good, loving God. We've, we've talked about how science actually proves that in the past. We don't have time for that. Purpose of life, love God, love others, to be in a relationship with Him, right? You were created for a purpose. Um, morality, how do you determine what is right and wrong? Well, the Creator determines that. He is the one who sets that, right? What is right, what is wrong? What is the purpose for which creation you were made? And then what happens when a person dies? Destiny, well, we see that th there is more to life than this, right? And one of the greatest evidences of that is Jesus' death and resurrection. And one of the things that made uh, even uh, Paul, who hated Christians, turn around and write the books of the letters because he encountered the risen Jesus, right? It had a big impact on him. Um, but nevertheless, those are the tent poles. Uh, and so now we've seen the overview of the book of Acts, right? We the purpose of it. Uh, now, one of the things we see in the book of Acts is the topic of the Holy Spirit. And that's something Christians, sometimes we might neglect or forget. What is this business about the Holy Spirit? We, we pray it, right? We have um, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. What is that all about? Uh, and we see actually um, in the book of Acts, when the Holy Spirit is poured upon the people, um, the disciples, amazing things happen. Actually, they start speaking in languages, the gospel, that they didn't know. And then the people that were in the town, uh, they were confused. Like, how, are they, how are they doing this? What is going on here? Um, because the Spirit indwelled, there was a miraculous sign, and they were proclaiming the gospel in languages that they didn't speak. And so that was one of the big events that happened here. And so real quickly, this is kind of the... I will do like three minutes. This is going to be more of like a lecture type style, but I just want to do this because there's a lot of things that the Bible says about the Holy Spirit that maybe you're not aware of. And so I'll do it real quickly. I don't want to take too much time on it, but um, you can go back and watch the video online if it's helpful. But it's very interesting to see what, who, who, is this Holy, who is the Holy Spirit? What, is, what does the Bible mean when it talks about that? You know, the, the Holy Spirit uh, of the Trinity. And, and so number one, it says the Spirit is said to go out of or, or proceed from the Father. We see that in John 15. Acts chapter 5 talks about actually this story in Acts chapter 5 um, on to the next one where it talks about uh, they have lied to the Holy Spirit and then he actually says, you have not just lied to human beings but to God, which is very interesting kind of a phrasing. Um, secondly, the Holy Spirit, number two, he's a person. Uh, 1 Corinthians 2 says, these are the things that God has revealed to us by his Spirit. The Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God, for who knows a person's thoughts except his own spirit within them? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. And thirdly, He is distinct from the Father and the Son. Uh, Matthew 28 says, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So what do we make of this? I, I guess a real quick snapshot, if you wanted to do this. The Bible basically construes 
um, it like this. So the Father is generally associated with God and his, his otherness, right? The God the Father, his otherness. The Son, which would be Jesus, that is God in the flesh, right? That is like the face of God, that in and through Jesus Christ of Nazareth indwelled the, the living spirit of the God, the creator of the universe, right? So he's like the face of God. Emmanuel, God with us, right? And then the Spirit, he's sort of like God on the ground or, or God with us. He is God um, in us, right? God at work, if you will, if that makes any sense. And so part of the thing as Christians, we're to be relying on God's Spirit to be guiding us, to be speaking us, to leading us, all that kind of stuff, empowering us. Um, but just, if you ever wondered kind of how that breaks down in Scripture, this is a really uh, quick snapshot maybe of how to make some sense of this like god exists as father son holy spirit how does our mind wrap around that <laughs> doesn't really right but i just say this is just because we can't fully grasp it this is how god is revealed right god the father god the son in jesus christ and the holy spirit that is sent to help guide lead and direct and i just say too we know just because we can't understand something doesn't mean it's not a possibility or reality because we, the analogy we we used before is like space, right? I mean, outer space. Like, imagine going all the way to the end of space. Well, how do you imagine that? Is there an end of space? Or is there not an end of space? If there is an end of space, what is one inch outside of that end, right? If there is no end, it just goes on forever. Like, both options are inconceivable, but it's got to be one or the other. And so just keep that in mind as we try to think about this and try to wrap our mind around the creator of the universe. Um, Ephesians chapter 2 says, For through him we have both access to the Father by one Spirit. Um, and again, we're almost done with this, but I just wanted you to see, look how much is written on the Holy Spirit in, in Scripture. So here, look at the work of the Holy Spirit. Here's some examples of the work of the Holy Spirit. Um, Conversion, the Spirit convicts of sin. This can, regeneration, the Spirit gives new birth. Father, Son, Spirit come to abide in us. We become partakers in the Son of the Spirit. Uh, first fruits of salvation. The Spirit seals believers belonging to Christ. Uh, possession of the Spirit is an indication that one has become a Christian. Um, we see also, too, the Spirit enables the Christian life. Here's some things the Spirit is said to be do. Um, indwells in believers, intercedes for us, empowers us illumines believers and glorifies the Son, enables believers to resist sin, produces fruit of Christ-like character, makes us holy, gives assurance that believers are God's children, transforms us into Christ's likeness, gives assurance of future resurrection, and uh, it also constitutes the church. Uh, we see it creates a believing community and dwells in the church, inspired scripture, guides the church, gives gifts to the church to build it up. The Spirit teaches, leads, and empowers the church on the Lord's behalf. And then lastly, the Spirit is bringing God's plan of redemption to completion. We see some of this going on. Go to Ephesians chapter 2. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not from yourselves, but as a gift from God. In John 15, when the Advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth will go out from the Father. He will testify about me. All right. That's a lot. Um, that was the lecture stuff. I didn't want to spend too much time on it because I, I get it. It can be a lot to take in. But I just wanted you to see how much Scripture really talks about the significance and the importance of the Holy Spirit. You know, Because the Holy Spirit is God's Spirit that is to be guiding us, leading us, and empowering us. Here's the thing. I, I think that a lot of times in the Western church, we've really neglected this. We've really not put a lot of focus on God actually, His Spirit working in us, empowering us, leading us. And we've really turned Christianity into just like a watered down religious thing, right? I go to church, I, 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 I read, maybe read the Bible, and then that's about it. But see, that's not what it's talking about. Like Christians that are being led by the Spirit, by God's Spirit, it's a relationship. Like you can have a relationship with the living God and it is much more fulfilling and real than just doing religious activities and routines, right? Like, that is, if you read the book of Acts, the Holy Spirit is what inaugurates the birth of the church. It empowers believers. Like, miraculous things are done. Uh, and so, uh, we cannot just forget about this, right? Uh, th here's a real question, right? How do we as Christians be led by God's Spirit? Like, how do we do that? How do I 
hear God? How do I be, be led by him? How is that even possible? And what are some things that we can learn from that? Because the truth is, we make a lot of decisions. I mean, like, even think about today. How many decisions did you make today? From the time you got up, from, you know, brushing your teeth, what to eat, what to wear, which way to turn, which, which, which you know, cl- directions, all, all, whatever other decisions, TV channels. Like, now these are, like, you know, minute decisions, of course. And, and I'm not saying that uh, you need to be praying, oh, God, what should I have for breakfast, a Pop-Tart or cereal? No, that's not what we're saying. But in your life, are you allowing God to direct you and to lead you? Uh, that is a big question. If you are a Christ follower, um, we should really be relying more and more on God to direct us and lead us. And we may say, how is that possible? First of all, look at Romans chapter 8. It says this, For those who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. And we just finished the book of John. Look, look what Jesus said about the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. John 14, 16. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. Verse 26. But the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and remind you everything I have said to you. And verse 26 and 15. When the advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who goes out from the Father will testify about me. And so, even Jesus says before, he says, I must go so the Spirit can be sent. That's why he had to go to the Father, right? And he even tells his disciples, do not even go outside of Jerusalem, do not even leave until the Holy Spirit is sent upon you, right? And so they're relying on God's Spirit, His power. Very significant. And so, all right, what do we do? How do we, how do we learn to do this? Or are we, are we doing this? Um, we're going to go a couple of things. We're going to go through real quickly some things that we need to not do and then some things that we should do if we want to be a people who are really walking with God, who are really being led by God in this relationship. Um, and, and we'll go from, from there. So, if I want to be led from God, number one is this. Okay, I cannot follow a world and a culture that doesn't follow God. Like, if you, re- if you honestly really want to be led by God, if you want to be walking with Him, you can't follow a world in a culture that doesn't follow God. You, you just can't do it. Like, how do you run in two different directions at the same time? You know? And this can be challenging, for sure. Uh, look at Romans chapter 12. says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and improve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. And Exodus 23 says, Do not follow the crowd in doing wrong. When you give testimony in a lawsuit, do not pervert justice by siding with the crowd, and do not show favoritism to the poor, um, to a poor person in a lawsuit. Meaning, you have to be just. You can't just go along with the crowd. This is so important because there are many people, many proclaiming Christians, that think, well, if culture says it's okay, if Politicians say it's okay, some celebrity says it's okay, if the law says it's okay, then it must be good and okay and moral. The answer is no, of course not. I mean, at one point, slavery was considered okay and moral. It was legal. Does that mean it's okay? Right? It was, uh, for the Holocaust and the Jews, that was legal, and it was uh, actually considered illegal to uh, hide and save Jewish people. That was legal. Was that okay? Is that moral? Of course not. So, like, just because something is legal doesn't mean it's moral or right. Just because culture says something is okay doesn't mean it really is, right? And so if you truly want to be walking with God and Him leading you and directing you, you can't follow a culture in a world that is not following God, that is going in the opposite way. That's just kind of a basic thing, right? And, and so um, there are many people who you can't, maybe don't hear from God and you're not being, feel like you can hear or know His will because you're too, you're too engulfed in culture, right? You want everything the world has to offer, but yeah, I'd like this Jesus thing too. I want to go to heaven one day. It's like, listen, God loves you. He created you. He knows what's best for you. He, he wants what's best for you. Will you trust Him, right? That's what it comes down to. Will you trust Him? And so if you want to follow God and, and be led by Him, you can't be led by a world and a culture that doesn't follow, follow God. And you're just, um, uh, it's, it's easy to get sucked into that, right? Because culture wants to tell you what is okay and what is acceptable. 
Um, when God says, listen, I'm the creator of the universe, I think I know better than some celebrity or politician or whatever. Number two, if I want to be led God's, by God's spirit, I can't follow friends who aren't led by God. You know what I mean? Like, there's a lot of bad advice out there. You know what I mean? Like, just because someone is your friend doesn't necessarily mean you should follow their way or their advice if they're not someone who is a godly person being led by God. Now listen, we all sin, we all make mistakes, we all struggle. Let's, let's not act like we're some holier than thou people. We're not. But if you really want to be led by God, you need to take note of who you're taking advice from, right? Because it's very easy to be led astray by people. The Bible talks about how important your friend selection is, right? Proverbs 13 says, Wise friends make you wise, but you hurt yourself by going around fools. 1 John 3, 7 says, Dear dear children, don't let anyone deceive you about this. When people do what is right, it shows they are righteous, even as Christ is righteous. You know? So if I want to follow God's direction, I can't let culture get me off track. I can't let friends get me off track. Now, does that mean that you can't be friends with people who aren't Christians? Well, no, of course not. I mean, Jesus hung out with people who were like the quote-unquote sinners of the day. Like, he hung out with people that the religious people looked down upon. So Jesus came and loved them, cared for them, right? But there's a, there's a balance here. I mean, so it means you just don't make sure you're not getting too entrenched to where you're taking advice from people who are going down the wrong road. I mean, John 2, 15 says, Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in them. But wait a second. John 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. What's that about? When he says don't love the world, that means like don't love the value system of the world. Don't get sucked into the sins and the, the, the destructive patterns of the world that go contrary to God's purposes. But like God loves, so it's, it's love the people, but don't love the value system. We often flip that. We love the value system, hate the people. Right? That's completely wrong, completely messed up. And so be careful who you are letting lead your life. You know, if you, if you want to know the direction of your life, again, what are you putting into your mind? Like, what books are you reading? What are you listening to? What are you watching? And who are the people you're hanging out with? That's going to largely determine where the direction of your life goes. It's just, you know, even the most successful people will tell you that. What are you feeling with your mind and your eyes and your ears? And who are the people you're hanging out with? Those two things will largely determine which area, which direction you're going to go for sure. And so um, keep that in mind, right? Uh, Next, if you want to know God's will for your life, and if you want to be led, I can't look to other sources besides God. Ask yourself, like, who is the source in my life? What is the source of my peace? What is the source of my happiness? What is the source of my security? What is the source of, like, what is the God of your life? Everyone is worshiping something. It could be yourself. It could be money. It could be your own intellect. It could be whatever. But, like, what is the God of your life? You can't look to other sources beside God, you know? Like, if you're looking for guidance on which way to go, if you're not looking to God, you're looking in the wrong place, you know what I mean? Uh, If you're looking to what some celebrity says, if you're looking to what your astrology chart says, you're you're making a mistake. It's it's, it's nonsense. It's, it's, It's going down the wrong road. And this is a problem even in the Old Testament, right? God's people continually looked all different places to find what they should be doing in the direction. And then we know what happened. God continually had to rebuke them for that. Here's actually an example in Deuteronomy. Look at some of the things they were engaging in back then. It says, for example, never sacrifice your son or daughter's burnt offering and do not let your people practice fortune telling or sorcery or interpret omens or engage in witchcraft or cast spells or function as mediums or psychics or call four spirits from the dead. Anyone who does these things is detestable to the Lord. It is because the other nations have done these detestable things that the Lord your God will drive them out ahead of you. Like, what? Well, that's what these other pagan nations were doing. And God says, listen, this is detestable. This is wrong. You're not going in the right direction. And God's people were engaging in this stuff. And he says, no. God's got to be your source of what your purpose is, what your direction is. If, he, if he's not, what is? That's a, that's, a, that's a really good question, right? Like, if God is not the source of 
who you are and your purpose and how you determine morality and all these things, well, what is? Is it your own opinion? Is it, is it, is it culture? Is it a celebrity? Is it like, what is it? And uh, if you want to be led by God, God's got to be the source for, for that. Number four is this is, I must stop being led by my circumstances, right? Some people might think, well, uh, you know, the circumstance I am in must be God's will for my life, must be God's you know, plan for me. Well, wait a second. I mean, uh, you know, I, I missed the bus, must be God's will. I, or, up, oh, I don't feel good, must be God's will. Or, oh, well, no, wait, wait no. Nah. Just because you're in a position doesn't necessarily mean that that's what God wants you to be in, you know? Um, there's plenty of examples of the Bible where people were doing things that God didn't want them to do. Like Jonah, right? God said, go to Nineveh and preach. Jonah said, no, I'm going to go over here. I'm going to run away. Did he want Jonah to do that? Well, no. You know, David, when he committed adultery with Bathsheba and then committed murder, did God want him to do that? Well, no. You know, and, and so just because you're in your circumstances, like your circumstances should not define you, right? You might be in a bad place. You might be in a challenging place. That doesn't mean that's where God wants you to be, right? It doesn't mean that that's God's best for you. And so don't just be led by your, your circumstances, you know? Um, number five is this, is I, I need to be careful about being led by my feelings. This is a big one. So many times we can just, just follow my feelings, just follow my emotions, like however I feel. But this is a dangerous thing to do, right? Because Feelings can be easily manipulated. Feelings can also tell us things maybe that aren't true. Um, and so if you're just guided by your feelings, this is actually a crazy thing in society now, right? Society basically says, well, if you feel a certain way, that means that it's okay. Well, no. I mean, that's one of the first things we teach little kids. Just because you feel like doing something doesn't mean you should do it. You're right? You teach little kids this. Yet as adults, we want to be like, well, I feel this way, therefore, listen, just because we are inclined or feel a certain way doesn't mean it's God's will or best for our lives. You know, all of us have inclinations. Some are healthy, some are unhealthy, some are good, some are bad, right? And so be careful being led by my feelings uh, because our feelings lie to us all the time. The Bible says the heart is deceitful, right? I go to Proverbs 14, says, there's a way that appears to be right, but in the end, it leads to death. And Isaiah 53 says, We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us have turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. The truth is, like, we can talk ourselves in and out of things pretty easily, you know. Even right now, you might be having conversation with yourself. Like, ah, I don't need to hear this. Ah, I don't know. You know, like, but if you truly want to find out your purpose for your life, if you truly want God to be leading you and directing you and find something for what he has for you, then take a step back and say, okay, are my emotions getting the best of me? You know? And also too, like, if you want to be led by God, check your emotions, right? Because like, somebody, like, if, God, if you're like, well, I feel like God is telling me I need to, you know, um, divorce my spouse of 30 years and marry this 18-year-old. Well, wait a second. Really? You think God's telling you that? Let's see. Well, let's go to God's Word. God's Word won't contradict Himself. So if we already know that wouldn't be true because that would contradict what His Word says. So maybe you're operating out of feelings. Maybe that's not what God is telling you to do. Maybe you're just trying to convince and, and go by your own feelings, right? That's why it's important for us to to look to the Word as well for these things, right? And so, okay, those are the things that we you to not do if you want to be led by God's by Spirit. Be, be alert of those things, right? If you truly, truly want to be led by the Spirit, these are some things you really have to um, keep alert of. Now, okay, real quickly, what are some things that we ought to do if you want to be led by God's Spirit, if you want God to be speaking to you and walking with you and leading you and empowering you? What are some things we can do to better position ourselves for that? Number one is this, I must want to be led. Like, if you don't want to be here, if you don't want to be led, if you don't want to hear, if you don't have any interest in this, you're like, you know what, I'm good, I, I'm, I'm fine, like, uh, I, I'll go to church and I'm a pretty good person and that's, that's, that's about good enough for me. Like, if you don't want more out of a relationship with God, I mean, 
you got to be honest about that, but like, do you want to be led by God? Like, do you really want this? Go to Psalm 40, verse 8 says, My God, I want to do what you want. Your teachings are in my heart. Secondly, is this, is I must be willing to do what God says. Like, are you actually willing to do what God says? You know, it's, it's a crazy thing to think about, but say, oh God, I want you to lead me, show me the way, what do you mean to do? And then we don't do it. You're like, ah, I'm good, God. Like, are you asking for just a suggestion? Like, what are, you, what are you trying to do here? I mean, time and time again, Jesus talks about, listen, if you are my disciple, you would follow my commandments and do what I say. You'll do the will of my Father in heaven because he loves you, he cares for you, he knows what's best for you. Are you willing to do this? John 7, 17 says, Anyone who chooses to do the will of the Father will find out whether my teaching comes from God or whether I speak on my own. So you got to be willing. you got to want it. And you got to be willing to actually follow God. That's the thing. Like We have to be willing to say, listen, you know what? I'm going to honor you. I'm going to trust you. I'm going to walk with you because I, you know what's best for me. You created me. And you know what's best for me? I mean, many times I myself have done it, you know, when we just, eh, we go our own way, but it doesn't lead to good things, you know? When we go against God's design, it does not lead to good things. It harms us, actually. It harms others. That's what sin does. It destroys, harms us, harms others, and breaks God's heart when we, when we do that because He loves us. Thirdly, you've got to look to God's Word, right? Oh, sometimes we forget that, you know what? How, how much has God already said? You know, sometimes you're waiting and waiting, God, what, what, do you, what should I do? God, what should I do? Like, but yet He's already said it in here, right? There's a lot He's already said. So go to Psalm 119, says, Your word is a lamp to guide my feet and a light to my path. Well, verse 133, Guide my steps by your words, so I will not be overcome by evil. God's will is laid out in His Word, right? What is, what is His will for your life? Now, not every minute detail is laid out in there, but you're going to find a lot of principles in there. You're going to find out the four big ones, right? Origin, meaning, morality, and destiny, which every worldview has to address. Uh, and, and so keep that in mind. Are, are you in there? Um, number four, what, what, have you ever asked? Have you ever asked the Holy Spirit to guide you? And it's a simple prayer. Father, I pray for more of your Holy Spirit. I pray that you lead me and direct me. What do you want me to do? Um, James 4 says you do not have because you do not ask. And so there's nothing wrong with asking and praying for God's will, for praying for more giftings, for praying for whatever. Like, why not? Why haven't you? Why don't we? Right? Uh, number five is this. is I must. This is the big one. I must listen for God's response. This is probably one of the biggest ones. Are you even listening to see what God might say to you? We often will pray and pray and pray, and then we'll just like go and do our own thing. But you never actually stop to listen to see what God's response might be. Have you realized that? You know? I must listen for God's response. Now here's the thing. It's not going to be that God's going to like, from heaven, and thunder and lightning bolts, and you know, John, listen to this. Like it's, it's not going to, I mean, it could, you know, but yeah, that's right, I picked on John today. Uh, oftentimes what happens is this. God will speak to you through these little nudges in your spirit. Like, there are whispers, there are nudges, they're, they're just like um, a prompting to do something or not do something. Are you listening to that? That's a big thing, you know? The reality is this, is if you are a, a true follower of Jesus, a Christian, God speaks to you. Here's what happens. Either, number one, you don't recognize it as God's voice, or number two, you're just so busy and you're wrapped up in your own little world you're not even listening. You're not even, you're not even it's, 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 you know, you're just walking through life about me and my thoughts and my problems and my agendas and my wants, and you're never even listening for what God might be wanting to say to you, right? So you either don't recognize it as God's voice or you're not even tuned in. You're just totally wrapped up in other stuff. And so here's the key is, like, spend some time after you pray and say, okay, God, what do you want to say to me? And just sit in silence and listen. And what do you feel rising up in your spirit? Many times, God speaks in whispers and nudges and promptings and, you know what I mean? Like, do you ever get, uh, do you ever get like, I'm a, I have different stories before, but like, for, for example, someone, um, they're out, of the re, out, of, out of the blue, they just got like the, the desire to call somebody and they called that person and that person was just about going to kill themselves. I've had people many times had that experience 
And it's like, well, where did that, that's weird. Where did that little prompt thing come from? Where did that, you know, where did that nudge come from? That's many times how the Spirit will work. Many times. You know? I've had many experiences in my times where, I, I've told you before, right? With the, well, I'm walking through Walmart and I just get like this little urge or nudge to talk to somebody or, or to speak to them. And, and I do, and some amazing things have happened from that. I told, you, know, you all know the story from many, many times, but for a while, when I was going through Walmart and things back in the day, I would get this, this talk to somebody, and I would just start talking to this person, like just regular conversation, you know, just, hey, how you doing? What's, what's going on? And the conversation would somehow end up, you know, and, and, and it, they would reveal to me they were into witchcraft, practicing witchcraft, which, like, that happened frequently. I'm like, what? Why? What is with God leading me to people that are into witchcraft? Like, what is that all about? Like, is that a coincidence that I continually was just prompted or felt to talk to this random person and the conversation came about and they were into witchcraft? Like, time and time again, like, it was really strange. But listen to this, um, the still small voice, the whisper, the nudges, like, I'm telling you, like, this, it, this, this, Listening will really make a big impact in your relationship with God. It, it'll take it from this kind of passive, just doing religious things, to now I am walking with God, I am talking with God, I am listening and hearing His promptings and nudges. It's, it's amazing. Do it. Like, try it. You will be amazed that you see some of the God moments that God will put into your life. I tell you right now, I mean, um, from experience. Now, we did a, a book on this months, maybe even a year ago, called The Five Second Rule. Basically says when you feel these promptings and you're, and you're attentive to it, then within five seconds, do it. Whether it's talk to somebody or to help somebody or to call, whatever the prompting is, right? Because um, basically the, the, the thought is if you, unless you do it within five seconds, you'll talk yourself out of doing it. Like, oh, I couldn't talk to that person. I couldn't do that. I couldn't, yeah, whatever. Um, but I have a lot of stories about this where this little prompting, this little voice, and um, you act on it, and just it's, it's amazing to, to see. Actually, it's a really weird, strange story. I'll tell you the true story. It, it, it's real, it, we would never think God would do this, but I have a professor from, um, from um, when I was in seminary, very well-educated professor, super nice guy. He was a chaplain in the military for years, professor at universities. He was at uh, seminaries. He was um, a pastor as well. Uh, and man, the stories he has of just walking in the Spirit. And, and the story, I've, I've told the story before a while ago, but this story, he um, was at a conference and he felt just like didn't want to go to that other conference. And so he just felt like he went to an IHOP. I think it was an IHOP or a Waffle House. And then he that he was down there eating, and he saw this homeless guy there, and um, he just got the urge, and I don't know what it was, and I don't know how God did it, but he, he gave him, I think it was like, I don't know what how many, it was four or five numbers to write down, and he gave it to the guy. Okay, and um, like, what is that all about? I don't know, I just, I, I just felt this urge, and then he was, he was curious, like, well, next day he wanted to check, and he checked the lottery, and it turns out if that guy played those numbers, he would have won, I forget how much it was, like $50,000 or something like that. And his wife's like, why didn't you play those numbers? And he's like, well, God didn't give those numbers for me. He gave me to give them to that guy. Now, right, many of you thinking, oh, God would never do that. Well, I'm telling you, this is a guy who is respectable, who is educated. This is a testimony story of what God has done. And like, how do you explain something like that? You know what I mean? And... Um, he has many, many stories. As well. I know many people who have stories like that. You know, in the book of Acts, when the Holy Spirit came upon them, they started speaking in tongues and different languages. I know people who have had that experience. I, I've had a per person today, they were, they were at a conference before, and um, there was these people from other, another tribe, and all of a sudden this person started speaking uh, the gospel in a language they didn't know, but it was this, per this, this tribe's language. Very weird, very strange. And I know, like, you start thinking, well, how is it even possible? But now we start realizing, like, this is the power of God, and it goes outside of our little, nice, neat little box, right? I think we have turned Christianity in the West into this little box. Well, you just believe this, get some water on you, uh, and then just do good, and then your ticket's punched to heaven. And you're totally missing that God's power, His Spirit, is very much at work, and are we limiting what God can do or, or, or might want to do through us because we're not attentive, we're not listening? But I just say, man, it, it, I know it's, it's probably stretching some of our thought process right now because you've never heard some of this stuff or been experienced to it. But I'm telling you, I know plenty of people 
and experience myself, when you start listening for God's promptings, when you start following these principles, you will be amazed at what God might want to say to you and do through you and act through you. Um, try it. Do it. You know what I mean? Uh, it, it takes something. Like, honestly, this is how the church flourished. Like, the birth of the church in the book of Acts was empowered by the Holy Spirit by miraculous things being done. It was not by people trying to create a new great program or a new Bible study teaching or a new, you know, whatever it might be, um, uh, dinner or whatever. No, no. This is God's power at work working through people. And I think we need to awaken ourselves up to the significance and importance of the Holy Spirit. The book, read the book of Acts and tell me otherwise. I, I think it's really, really important. Job 33 says this, God does speak, sometimes one way, sometimes another, even though people may not understand it. God speaks in various ways, right? He can speak through different things. Um, the question is, are you listening? And are you willing then to also act on what God is leading you to do? Uh, and so I encourage you this morning, um, see, see the purpose of the book of Acts, uh, see the significance of the Holy Spirit, especially in the book of Acts and Jesus talks about, and then walk in the Spirit. Be led by the Spirit. The Bible says do not resist the Holy Spirit. Actually, the Bible says you can grieve the Holy Spirit when we engage in sin and things like that, right? Uh, we're to worship in spirit and truth. And so let's get out of the little box of thinking and start living a real relationship with God led by the Holy Spirit. Now I just say this too is, um, do I do this all the time? Pfft. No, I fail all the time. You know what I mean? Um, I'm just a regular person, and uh, I fail all the time. I get wrapped up in my own little world, my own little things. But the truth is we have to realize this is about our own life and about even the church and ministry. It's not about what we want. It's not about what you prefer. What does God want to do? What is God's will? What is God's leading? Right? And that means you got to do what the Bible says is die to self, right? Um, pick up the cross, bear it, and um, say, Father, your will be done, not my own. But that takes you putting down your pride and allowing him to lead and direct. Um, but also, you make sure you, when you feel prompted, um, put it up against the word. Make sure it doesn't contract his word. Talk to someone spiritually matured. Also, if you're not sure if that's something from God, but um, listen and act. See what God will do. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this day and everybody here. God, you're the creator of the universe, and um, we know your gospel talks about the world was created by a good, loving God. Things got messed up, but you have a plan to restore it and to redeem it. And you have acted, acted decidedly in and through your son, Jesus Christ. One of the greatest evidences of that, of why the church even began and flourished, was because of the death and resurrection of your son, Jesus Christ, the evidence that death has been overcome, evil has been overcome, and all of those who humble themselves and walk with you will one day be raised again and be part of the new creation when one day you recreate and restore heaven and earth the way we know is intended to be. Because we know right now things are off, shouldn't be this way. Things are broken, things are messed up. But God, one day you're going to restore all things. And all those who humble themselves and trust unto you will be with you. And Father, as disciples of you, as followers of you, we know we all sin. We all make mistakes. We're far from perfect. Forgive us for our sins. And Father, we ask that through your Spirit, you continue to guide us and lead us. We pray right now, Lord, give us more of your Holy Spirit. Empower us, lead us, that we might in faith step out, continue to listen moment by moment what you might want to say to us, and then in faith act upon that, Lord, and see what you can do. Worshiping in spirit and truth, living in spirit and truth. And Father, if there's anyone here this morning, if you're here this morning and you've, you don't know what, where you're at. You don't know where you're at spiritually. Maybe you're confused. Maybe you have questions. It's okay. But if you're here this morning and you know just in your heart right now that God's speaking to you and you're not right with God, you can get right with God. And you can just pray this prayer. Say, Father God, I come before you and I need you. I have questions. I don't know a lot of stuff, Father, but I know that I need you. I know that I, I need your forgiveness. I need your mercy and grace because I know I can't save myself. 
I know I've sinned and I've gone my own way and tried to be Lord of my life. But God, I want you to be Lord of my life. I want you to lead me and direct me and show me my purpose. And Father, I'm asking you to come into my life and save me. And I can't save myself and I'm trusting in what you've done in and through your son, Jesus Christ, through his death and resurrection for me. That I'm saved not by what I can do, but by what you've done. And I'm committing to repenting, to turning from my sin, turning from a self-centered way of living and turning towards you. Father, I pray that you give me your Holy Spirit and lead me and direct me. I want you to save me. Help me, lead me, direct me. If you said that prayer, the angels are rejoicing and I encourage you to know that you are secure because you're trusting in God. But now walk with Him. It's not a magic prayer. You have to mean it and you have to walk with Him and let Him lead your life. Could you talk to me or someone afterwards to see what this entails in your journey with God? God, guide us, lead us, direct us. In Christ's name, amen.